Hello and welcome to another TLDR Explains video. I feel everyone must be sick of me saying this, but there's not long left for the UK and EU to reach a Brexit deal, which both sides still claim that they want. Initially the deadline for negotiations was set to be today, when the EU meet for their October summit in Brussels. And while Brexit is still on the agenda, Johnson and von der Leyen agreed to push the deadline back a month into November. Regardless, even with an extension, it's not all plain sailing for the UK and EU, with Barnier remarking that the final two weeks of October would be the crunch period if the deal was going to be ratified on time. That certainly doesn't leave much time left, especially when the UK and EU still can't agree on some major issues. In a couple of other videos, we've discussed the issues that the UK and EU have faced surrounding fishing and the common fisheries policy. So in this one, we're going to take a look at the other major stumbling block. We'll explain what state aid is and why it's become such a sticking point for Brexit negotiations. If you like the content we make and want to lend us a hand, you might want to check out our merch store. You can represent the channel by sticking a Countries With Shoes pin badge on your bag or jacket, now available for basically every country. Or you can just cover your stuff in stickers or magnets. Or if you prefer, check out our book, Brexit The Colouring Book. We have super low stock on our first edition. Anyway, check out the store by clicking the link in the description and the first 50 people will get 12% off their order using code STATEAID. So you might have heard recently that Brexit negotiations aren't going brilliantly. Now, most of these negotiations are done in secret, so we don't know exactly what's holding them up. But according to reports and the occasional briefing from Michel Barnier or David Frost, a lot of the disagreement is about something called state aid. State aid, which we'll explain in a bit more detail in a second, is one of the EU's many level playing field provisions, along with competition, taxation, labour and environmental standards. It's basically about how much the state can help its national industries via subsidies and tax relief. It's under so-called level playing field provisions because obviously massively subsidising your own national industries gives them an unfair advantage over companies in other countries. It's not a level playing field. Anyway, at the start of negotiations, the EU wanted the UK to completely sign up to its state aid regime, which is under the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice of the European Union. While on the other hand, the UK wanted complete independence over its state aid regime. So basically, the UK wanted to subsidise whoever it felt like, whenever it felt like it. The UK's argument was that CETA, the EU-Canada trade deal that Johnson's government seems so keen on emulating, doesn't have anything in it about state aid. So that's what they want. The EU's argument was that that's not the same thing. The EU and UK do a lot more trade together. They're geographically right next to each other, and they have similar regulations and business cultures. So, for example, the UK massively subsidising its agricultural industry would have a far greater impact on the EU market than if Canada did the same thing. To be fair to the EU, this was also sort of agreed in the political declaration that both sides signed off on, which reads, The future relationship must ensure open and fair competition, encompassing robust commitments to ensure a level playing field. The UK's response was, in effect, that the political declaration isn't legally binding, which, to be fair to the UK, is true. Anyway, both sides seem to have softened their stance a bit. The EU no longer expects the UK to just sign up to its state aid regime. It's said that it's happy as long as the EU regime is taken as a reference point. And the UK, which originally wanted to be able to do whatever it wants, and only report on state aid programmes every two years, now seems to be coming round to the idea of some sort of regulator, at least according to David Frost's comments to the House of Lords Select Committee earlier this month. Regardless, nothing has been agreed as yet, which is interesting, because it's hard to see why the UK is quite so bothered about this. The EU's average level of state aid is 0.7%, and the UK has rarely ever broken EU state aid laws, and in fact, historically has used very little state aid, representing only 0.4% of GDP in 2017. So what's their issue? Well, to be honest, even if the UK has historically stayed within the rules, the EU state aid system is pretty flawed. 
It's both ambiguous and it's slow. In fact, the term state aid actually originates in EU law and is not actually defined in any other legal system. And the EU law definition, as given in Article 107, Paragraph 1 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, reads, Save as otherwise provided in the treaties, any aid granted by a member state or through state resources in any form whatsoever, which distorts or threaten to distort competition by favouring certain undertakings or the production of certain goods, shall, insofar as it affects trade between member states, be incompatible with the internal market. So, there are apparently two criteria for illegal state aid here. One, the aid has to distort or threaten to distort competition. And two, it has to affect trade between member states. Now, this is clearly ambiguous because threaten to distort is not the same as distort. In other state aid systems, like the WTO Agreement on Subsidies and Countervailing Measures, known as the SCM Agreement, state aid is considered illegal only if it actually harms competition, not just if it threatens to harm which is obviously a more ambiguous criterion. Finally, the EU's definition of what falls under state aid has expanded in recent years. For example, in September 2019, the CJEU ruled that an Advanced Pricing Agreement, or APA, granted by Luxembourg to the car company Fiat that basically reduced its tax liability by 30 million euros was a violation of EU law. Interestingly, at about the same time, the court ruled that an APA granted by the Netherlands to Starbucks for a similar amount of money wasn't a violation of EU law. This was so confusing that even an advocate general for the CJEU called it difficult. And this is partly why it's ambiguous. The definition of state aid can apparently expand, and it doesn't seem to be applied consistently. Or at least, the rules aren't obvious if it is. Anyway, so that's the ambiguity point the EU state aid system is also really slow. This is in part because all state aid is prohibited under EU law by default. Aid either has to qualify for an exemption, or if it doesn't, the state has to notify the EU in advance. Also, the EU de minimis level is set very low, at €200,000 over three years. So any aid larger than that requires notification or exemption. In part because of the ambiguity mentioned earlier, lots of these cases sit in court for a while, which is why the CJEU has a serious backlog of cases. To make sense of how slow this can be, the bridge which connects Copenhagen and Malmo was finished in 2000, and its state aid review is still going on, 20 years later. This uncertainty and slowness is bad for both businesses and states, Businesses, because they have to somehow price in the possibility that in 10 years time the EU will force them to give back whatever subsidies they've received, and states, because they're left with the joyless job of trying to claw back this money from corporations. So this is largely why the UK wants to leave the EU state aid regime. Not necessarily because it wants to subsidise EU firms out of business, something it has no precedent of doing, but rather because it could have a more efficient system, with a higher de minimis limit, a clearer definition of state aid revolving around a criterion of actual economic harm rather than just the threat of harm, and no backlog of unsolved cases, all regulated by the well-reputed Competition and Markets Authority, which is what Theresa May originally suggested. So why doesn't the UK just tell the EU that? Why doesn't it just say, hey, we want our own slightly more efficient system. We'll commit to doing not too much state aid, like we always have, and only doing it in areas we all agree on. Well, it seems the problem for the UK is it doesn't really know what it wants here. According to reports from the FT, some people in government, like Dominic Cummings, don't want any rules at all. And some, like Alok Sharma and Andrea Leadsom, think rules are a good thing. After all, state aid rules stop the state from spending too much taxpayer money propping up businesses for political reasons. For example, you can imagine a government spending loads of money subsidising the UK fishing just to make sure they keep their coastal seats. And domestic state aid rules would prevent this. And this is where the UK-Canada analogy doesn't hold water, because Canada already has its own interprovincial state aid system. 
Anyway, even if the UK could figure out what it wants, there would still remain the question of the dispute resolution mechanism. Basically, if the EU thought that the Competition and Markets Authority was being too lenient, or letting the government get away with too much state aid, there needs to be some way of sorting out that disagreement. In the EU's ideal world, it would be the CJEU who ruled on it, but obviously the UK's not too keen on that, so they'll have to come up with some kind of creative solution if they want to solve this issue. Anyway, if the EU and UK can't agree on a state aid regime that supersedes the Northern Ireland Protocol, then we're in for a real fight, because as things stand, the UK is basically signed up for the EU state aid regime. As we mentioned in an earlier video on the Internal Markets Bill, the UK isn't too happy about this, and is apparently willing to break international law to get out of it. Hopefully they can find common ground and it won't have to come to this, but it's not looking promising so far. Negotiations are always moving though. Both Lord Frost and Michel Barnier are sending subtle hints about what's going on behind closed doors. Building on Lord Frost's appearances in front of the Lords Parliamentary Committee, he sent the clearest signal yet that a compromise is in the pipeline. We'll continue to update you on the status of this dispute and others in future videos, as well as whether they end up fundamentally getting in the way of a Brexit deal. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified when we release further videos on this and other topics. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name listed at the end of the videos, then be sure to back us on Patreon. The link to that's in the description.